Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Ian Tuttle of National Review, who is in for Jim Garrity today. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. We had two good martinis yesterday, which means we have vastly exceeded our quota for the week, Ian. So we have no good martinis today. We have bad, and we think crazy and crazy. It could be bad, bad, crazy. Anyway, there's no good news today. But let's just start <laughs> with the first martini. Let's, let's put it that way. This is courtesy of CBS News, but virtually everyone is reporting this today. According to a hard-hitting government task force report released Thursday, intelligence generated by U.S. Central Command, also known as CENTCOM, was manipulated to paint a rosier picture of the U.S. effort to combat ISIS in Iraq and Syria. The report finds that beginning in mid-2014, final intelligence reports issued by CENTCOM contradicted the initial internal assessments made by its own analysts, according to CBS News correspondent Jim Axelrod. Quote, the facts on the ground didn't match what the intelligence was saying out of the United States Central Command, said Kansas Congressman Mike Pompeo, a member of the task force. The task force stemmed from a whistleblower complaint from a senior analyst at CENTCOM alleging that intel had been manipulated. The complaint is under active investigation by the Defense Department Inspector General. But the story goes on to say it wasn't just classified intelligence. The task force also found that CENTCOM's public statements were far more positive than events on the ground warranted, such as in March 2015 when the CENTCOM commander, General Lloyd Austin, testified to Congress that ISIS can no longer do what it did at the outset. So, Ian, this story had had been around uh, earlier when the whistleblower story came out, but now we've had a thorough investigation here, and it's obvious that intelligence was manipulated not only for public consumption, but for classified information inside the government. This is this is really troubling. Yeah, the latter part is just <laughs> extraordinary. I'd at least like to think that they're only uh, defrauding the public; they're not, you know, defrauding each other. You're right. This, this story's sort of been uh, kicking around for um, a year now, I think. I think the first revelations came out about a year ago that this sort of thing was happening, but we didn't have hard and fast evidence. It seems like now we do. The I believe the report says at one point that 40% of the people they uh, interviewed who were involved in this area said that they had felt pressure from higher-ups to, to change the information. I mean, it's just astonishing. I think this is a perfect example of the trend we've seen without the Obama administration, which is that uh, politics rules all to a, um, a, a different extent in a different circumstance. I mean, this is what happened uh, with Benghazi, where you had very clear, um, you know, very clear intelligence about exactly what was happening on the ground, but you saw that political actors were changing the narrative. The same thing with the uh, Iran deal and, and, and Ben Rhodes. It's not at all, uh, at least it shouldn't be surprising to anyone who has their eyes open, that the the same administration that's really been completely gun-shy on doing anything about ISIS is manipulating the intelligence to make it look rosier uh, than it is. That's been the MO of this administration for uh, seven and a half years. Ian, maybe I'm a little bit naive here. I mean, I expect politicians to spin. I expect them to cherry pick positive information, uh, not admit certain things yeah. that, that would be damaging to them, but to yeah. fabricate sure. things out of whole cloth uh, on something as critical as this, not only for the public, but also their own internal considerations. I mean, we're on the, the fringe of a banana republic here, it sounds like. It's so, so bizarre. I, you know, I don't... I. I I'm not an expert at all in this area, so I don't know what the motivations would be to, to cook things internally like that. But it really is alarming. We'll, we'll see if this um, you know, breaks through the other noise. Unfortunately, I doubt it, but this really is a, an astonishing, uh, astonishing story. On to the second martini now. This could be classified as bad or crazy. I guess uh, in, uh, in a vacuum, if you just believe people's words, things like this will never happen again in a Donald Trump administration. Because remember, Ian, just a couple of weeks ago, Donald Trump said this at the Republican National Convention. I have joined the political arena so that the powerful can no longer beat up on people who cannot defend themselves. Nobody knows the system better than me, which is why I alone can fix it. 
I alone can fix it. Our only hope for uh, solving our problems in Washington and beyond is for Donald Trump to be the next president, which makes his comments on Squawk Box on CNBC all the more curious. Instead of uh, being about uh, making sure that he wins, which he says he still wants to do, he says if he doesn't win, eh, it's okay. All I do is tell the truth. I'm a truth teller. All I do is tell the truth. And if at the end of 90 days... I fall in short because I'm somewhat politically correct, even though I'm supposed to be the smart one and even though I'm supposed to have a lot of good ideas. It's okay. You know, I go back to a, a very good way of life. It's not what I'm looking to do. I think we're going to have a victory, uh, but we'll see. Yeah, the nominee should be smart and the nominee should have good ideas. Uh, <laughs> could talk a little bit about uh, him being nothing but a truth teller here. But, uh, Ian, this is a guy who uh, is only about winners. He loves winners. He hates losers. Doesn't even like POWs because they got captured. But now all of a sudden he's okay if he gets throttled in November. <laughs> yeah, the country is on the brink. I'm the only one who can fix it. But, eh, you know, what, whatever. If I don't, it's no big. Right? I mean,. Look, there's more coming out uh, sort of day by day, especially um, from people who are sort of inside these circles that that Trump uh, may be less uh, committed to winning than um, many people, especially his most uh, uh, fanatical supporters, have thought over the course of this election. Uh, and as many of us theorized uh, a, a while back, there was not very much evidence that Donald Trump actually wanted to be the president as much as he just wanted to win whatever that might mean in the circumstances that started with a primary win, et cetera. This shouldn't be surprising. At the end of the day, Donald Trump is all about Donald Trump. If it looks like things are going to be classier and more luxuriant in the White House than at Trump Tower, then he'll opt for the White House. And if it's, uh, you know, if the shoe's on the other foot, he'll, he'll go the other direction. So there's no real contradiction here in principle because Trump doesn't have any principles by which he's abiding. The other thing I, I should add is, you know, when we look at the evidence that Trump, you know, say, really wants to win the presidency, a person who wants to win the presidency doesn't say that the sitting president who has the highest approval ratings he's had in, in a couple of years now was the founder of the Islamic State. That's a direct quote. And then goes on to the Hugh Hewitt show. And when Hugh gives him the opportunity to, to say, no, 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 I know what you meant. Uh, I, I think I, I know what you meant. You know, you meant X doesn't respond by saying, no, <laughs> I meant exactly what I said. He founded ISIS. You have all of these people telling Trump, look at what you're saying. You're getting into the, uh, a fight with a gold star parent, uh, gold star parents, and your polls are falling. Don't do this. You're saying X and it's leading to Y. And we have very good evidence of this. If you, if, if you want to win, don't do that. If someone someone who actually wanted to win would follow that advice, at least nominally in, in some small but obvious ways, Trump is not willing to do any of that. At this point, if you continue to believe that what Donald Trump really, really wants is to be president of the United States, um, you're you're just going on on faith at this point. Don't fear. Don't fear. Our last martini involves Hillary Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> We're back to Hillary for this is definitely a crazy. The Deseret News uh, out of Salt Lake City has invited all the major presidential candidates, that includes, in their mind, Gary Johnson, to address readers on their opinion pages. And this one has Hillary Clinton in the byline. I'm sure that she didn't actually write it. But the campaign decided that they were going to talk about religious freedom and the Constitution uh, as one of the reasons why Utah voters should pick Hillary Clinton this year. The title is exclusive. Hillary Clinton, colon, what I have in common with Utah leaders, religious freedom and the Constitution. Let's take a look at some of the excerpts here. She says, as Americans, we hold fast to the belief that everyone has the right to worship however he or she sees fit. I've been fighting to defend religious freedom for years. As Secretary of State, I made it a cornerstone of our foreign policy to protect the rights of religious minorities around the world, from Coptic Christians in Egypt to Buddhists in Tibet. We stood up for these oppressed communities because Americans know that democracy ceases to exist when a leader or ruling faction can impose a particular faith on everyone else. That was true all the way back in 1786 when Thomas Jefferson wrote that all men shall be free to profess and by argument to maintain their opinion in matters of religion. All of which sounds pretty good, Ian, and it should because it's, it is the founding principles on which our country was uh, started uh, back in the 18th century. 
But there's some problems here. First of all, she talks about standing up for the Coptic Christians. Uh, they were cheerleading the ouster of Mubarak and the entrance of the Muslim Brotherhood, which made life absolutely miserable for Coptic Christians. Uh, the Obama administration has done nothing to help uh, the Christians in the zones impacted by ISIS. And when it comes to preserving the belief that everyone has the right to worship however he or she sees fit, I just drug up this clip from earlier in the campaign. All the laws we've passed don't count for much if they're not enforced. Rights have to exist in practice, not just on paper. Laws have to be backed up with resources and political will. And deep-seated cultural codes, religious beliefs, and structural biases have to be changed have to be changed to endorse abortion is what the whole theme of that speech was about. So, Ian, uh, a, a lot in here, none of which seems to be true. Uh, hypocrisy run amok with this op-ed. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, as you point out, Greg, there are the half-truths about her time as Secretary of State, where she made certain noises about uh, religious freedom, but it would, it would, it's laughable to think that that was, in some, that was some sort of cornerstone of her work abroad. But secondly, her entire political career in domestic politics, especially, uh, has been devoted to crushing these rights in almost every uh, venue where she can can do so, especially on um, abortion. And now she's a, a firm backer because the political winds have changed of of all of the different um ways of stripping conscience rights because of, of same-sex marriage. This idea that she's some, uh, she's some valiant defender of religious freedom is just astonishingly untrue. I should add, though, you, can, you know this in part because she, she shows her hand in the op-ed in the form of, of language in the same way that the Obama administration has done in its different efforts to sort of massage this issue, where she talks about uh, freedom of worship. Right. This is something the Obama administration started several years ago. The issue is not worship. The issue is not, you know, whether you can go into your church and believe the things that you believe inside that sacred space, although increasingly that is becoming an issue. The question is whether those beliefs can be acted out and effective in the public sphere, which is something that the Democratic Party almost en masse is now militantly against. So the language of the the First Amendment and the language of freedom of worship are different, and one is far more reductive um, than the other. So she's even playing games here with that. The last point is, though, it's interesting that she takes this uh, attack. It, it suggests, um, and I think you'll, you'll probably see this to a certain extent, the Clinton campaign is pretty confident that they can make a play for Utah. And that's an, ext that's an extraordinary thing, given the, um, given the nature of, of the electorate out there. One more thing I've got to say, Ian, about her time as Secretary of State. This has been a hallmark of the Obama administration, both during her time as Secretary of State and ongoing since then. And that's the weaponizing, essentially, of the LGBT agenda for nations around the world, that if they want partnerships with the U.S., if they want better relations, if they want foreign aid, they've got to get on board with the LGBT agenda. And that even continues to this day in sub-Saharan Africa, which, of course, was ravaged for decades by a horrific AIDS crisis, which is finally getting better. And here is the uh, Obama administration with Hillary Clinton out front for four years, pushing that down the throats of people who are finally on the upswing. On that note, Ian? Yeah, if, you need, if you need, um, if, if, if you need uh, you know, some, some light in your day, go back and listen to yesterday's <laughs> podcast, too. So yes, maybe the good will balance it out. Uh, I guess it does average out. Maybe we'll have a good one tomorrow. <laughs> There's only one way to find out. Tune in then. Ian, I'll talk to you tomorrow. All right. Thanks, Greg. Ian Tuttle of National Review in for Jim Garrity today. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us, and be sure to tune in again on Friday for the next Three Martini Lunch.